All right. So I think it's started and we can start working on this project. Um, part of this I'm going to actually be debugging because apparently I have not tested this project very much in Windows. I tend to only pro test it on uh, my Mac, but it is cross-platform and just needs some cleanups. And you also are going to get some blatant errors. In fact, I think all the remaining errors are ones you're going to get if you run the tests. But uh, let's start with an intro. So Quail is a project that I started on after my effort with the EQG, EQG ZI system, which is a zone importer for EQG files, right? So what it did, that thing, is it was focused on zone importing. Uh, what Quail is doing is it's breaking down a lot of the file formats that are found inside of EverQuest and it's breaking it out so that each one can be parsed, loaded, and various operations can be done on it. So um, it's a very in-progress project, but to kind of show it in context, we're going to go hop into a EverQuest uh, copy. So I'm going to grab this vanilla RF2 client that I have. And let's go grab just, in fact, I have a couple examples here I need to grab anyways, like Steam Font. So Steam Font Mountains, right, has a EQG file. And inside of it, there's a bunch of different types of files. The DDSs are textures, the dot lit, this is lighting data. Um, and that is actually one of the file formats that there is some support for. As you can see in the readme lit, I have load and save. Um, it's not amazing just yet, though, on its uh, support. Uh, it also does EQG Z extraction, <laughs> EQG extraction, uh, but I also support TOG, which is a definition file of sorts with like toggleable features, I guess. The TOG is a little ambiguous, the naming. Um, there are a couple other file formats in here, like the, let me see if I can find them. I haven't touched eco, haven't touched dat. The dot zon file, that is also covered to a certain extent. Uh, also the dot mod files here. So these are the models of like placeable objects or objects that are baked into the you know onto the zone and it is instant, meaning it's replicatable in multiple areas. And that's just to save on space when this thing gets baked. You know, like obviously having geometry of the exact same multiple times can be expensive to just define the geometry every time. So that's why they made these mod files. And yeah, so as you can see, kind of the goal with the project is the ability to work on the files that are inside. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and copy the Steam Font Mountain EQG and toss it into Quail into the, I believe I have a EQ directory that I tend to put these in. It's actually been a bit since I've used this. And if you run uh, Quail, well, first of all, I have a path error again. Blend path. Yeah, we can just do this. All right, so we get a little completion thing here, right? And one of these steps is that we can extract and we can inspect. And if we go ahead and let's just build the binary. So quail.exe is about to get built. You can see there. And if I run quail.exe, we get this, right? And we can go ahead and like inspect um, the EQ uh, steam font file. Oh, inspect called. <laughs> but what we're really after is extracting. Extract called. Did it actually extract? No. Ha. <laughs> I guess my code is uh, incomplete. Where the heck is this? Is going to be under command extract. Why is it just saying extract called? What? <laughs> yeah. 
something's weird here. You should be getting an error of attempting to extract. Uh, I was trying to be cool and show it off, but apparently there's some issues with Windows I got to clean up. Nevertheless, we can just open this file with EQZip for now and essentially make a folder in here called Steam Font Mountains, I think .eqg. We can verify the naming. I have some baked test files, as you can see here, and some of them require, yeah, the um, the file content. So what I can just go ahead and do for now is extract all of the EQG over here. And once this finishes, we'll fix at least that one test because it was bothering me. Um, in fact, I already did, I think. No, it's still there. So we need the grass steam font DDS to be in here because I guess that's... Oh, no, this thing auto-converted. We do not want this to auto-convert. Yeah, we don't want that step. So we can go ahead and delete this real quick. We can re-extract, and this time it'll actually make DDS files. This is important because when you auto-convert to PNG, you break the linking. So now that they're DDSs, this script should run right. Potentially. Yeah, so you can see here now there's no error about Steam font after this next test. These other errors are because those files don't exist in apparently EQ. There's a temp directory and there's a couple um, GLTFs that I don't bake because they are, um, you know, not necessarily copyrighted, but they have their own licensing. So I just don't bother with them. But now that we got that working, we can go ahead and show off, you know, a little bit of how this works. So if you target most files, let, let's see if we can find one uh, that we could test real quick. So if we go to like mod, right, and we do a, why not? Well, <laughs> so this one is attempting to use eCommons GLTF, which of course I don't have on this for uh, this computer. Same thing with. Uh, a lot of these actually. I really should start looking at getting a lot of these available on this project. I have a lot of baked, you know, local stuff, but even this, you can see that it's uh, essentially what this project is doing is there's a bunch of packages and each package supports different types of files. And um, the whole purpose of this project is to parse and convert various parts of EverQuest. So take a source file, import it, put all the data in, and then save it as something else. Um, that's essentially like the big objectives of a lot of these things. So um, yeah, what about... Doesn't the mod have a load test with, well, it has the cube mod, and then here's the object, object gears mod, right? I think that's from, uh, yeah, you can see that it is right here. So what we're gonna actually do is we're gonna update this to go to EQ steam font mountains.eqg like this, and this might actually work now, let's see. Okay, so it has issues with the temp directory because it's not made. We can make that real quick. And there. So what that just did is we spit out, okay, here's a great example of what this project can do. Uh, what that just did is it took the uh, the mod file for the object of gears and it analyzed the data. Like if we even go to the load, we can see here, I have a file reader and it goes through and analyzes all the different parts of the binary, reading the header, and it prints out this cool picture and this picture is basically a disassembly 
of this file and how it's structured. So if you actually opened up the object gears mod file, which it doesn't go open when I do that way, object gears mod, and we open it with a hex editor, you can see here it has like the EKGZM and all this. That is what the inspection view is also going to show right here. The only difference is I put dot dot on areas that are skipped. So like if we just look at it like this, this will help you kind of visualize what I'm talking about. So you can see here the header file is defined here. And then after these bytes is the version. That's what these four bytes are for. Then you have like name length. This is the size of the file names and the material count, which is three. You see what I mean? How many vertices that's calculated there. And you can kind of just match what's inside this file with quail. And this visualizer just kind of helps break down what everything is. And then here's all the properties that are baked inside the mod file, including like bone data and all the other geometry that's baked. So, that's basically kind of the um, the goal is to disassemble all these proprietary file formats and turn them into manageable, parsable files. Because once they are loaded, right, like which is what we have theoretically, the next step is to generate the out file. So um, if we go to out two, put it over here. This file is essentially an attempt to regenerate the mod file from the loaded data. And you can see here, it's relatively accurate. I think I have some parts that are gonna need some TLC, like the vert data um, and the bone data. Lost the war, good soup. <laughs> I don't know if my auto, audio notif notifications work on uh, Streamlabs, unfortunately. So you might have just redeemed hundred bucks and or hundred in game coins or stream coins or whatever they call it, and it doesn't even uh, work. But that's all right. Um, yeah. Anyways, so yeah, the goal is to import export because if you can get import export to work, then. We can then, uh, like for example, mod files, we can import from GLTF or OBJ. You know, like these are proprietary, not proprietary. These are uh, most 3D modeling tools can take these file types and export them from their tools. We can take that data and then turn it into mod files, right? And in the same perspective, we can export, like this isn't noted here, but export to GTLTF would be the next step, right? So then we have true bi-directional importing and exporting conversions going on. Uh, that's kind of the, the goal with Quail. And you'll notice that this kind of takes a step back from what EQGZI did, because in EQGZI, it took the entire EverQuest EQG file and turned it into like this, you know, conglomerated plate of every part of it. With this program, you can specifically target a file and it will parse just that file and any sort of relative data according to it, right? So like when you load a mod, it does have references to material and texture files. So those do get referenced and loaded potentially, but they're not a, um, you know what I mean? It's, it's not requiring the full EQG assembly. Um, cause the general goal of this project is when you have a project or a, a file like steam font, you can manage it now as a folder like this and basically hot edit all this data to prep it to be finally, um, exported. So yeah. Anyway, so like here, let's, let's look at a toggle. Oh, this is just a test file, so this is definitely going to work. Yeah, this is just going to generate a uh, the buffer. What does it save it as? Where does it put this? I think it just spits it out on the file. 
I need to get a little bit more consistent with my inputs and outputs on this project. It's a little all over the place. But you can see here, I'm creating from nothing a toggle file and then I'm generating this data with it, which is test one, test two. Because toggle files are actually kind of human readable. You can see over here. They, uh, but they define objects and they're usually based on a light data, you can see here. So this is something I'm hoping to fully support at some point. Um, some other areas that this kind of talks over. Uh, yes and no, dead zergling. Quail is built to hyper-focus on specific files, but also do the all-in-one, right? So Quail does do, the, the goal is to have Quail do all the different features that like EGZI is currently doing. However, you get a little bit more control at the you know individual step, right? So like, instead of having to fret over, you know, take X file and turn it into Y and all the implications in between, uh, I'm breaking it down so all the implications in between can be tested, can be identified, can be parsed, and can even be done individually, right? And then we can assemble all the pieces to generate the whole orchestration. You know what I mean? So we're focusing on the trumpets and we're making sure that they, you know, play the horns properly. And then we're, you know, focusing on the strings, instruments, the clarinets and all that. And then when we're all done, we can basically take like a blend file and turn that just like what EQGZI does, turn that into a EQG file, right? That's kind of like the end goal. But in order to do that, there's a lot of moving parts in between, right? For like every object instance, the definitions of them, um, how those objects are actually defined. I want to get that all so that it's isolated and scoped so that we can focus and fix problems. Because one of the problems with EQGCI is you get one little hiccup on the whole all-in-one and the whole thing crashes, right? Or it doesn't load the file. With Quail, right, you can now specifically pick a file that's independent and analyze and work on that specific support without having to worry about the big picture stuff, right? Like, for example, my apparently EQG extractor is a little wonky right now, uh, but that doesn't matter. I can use something else, extract it, and now that I have, um, I can take advantage of what's been extracted for the other steps. Yeah, exactly, Zergling. Um, and not to say that like Quell fixes that necessarily, the one mistake, zero KBG, you know, but it does um, improve the overall experience. But yeah, that's kind of the, the goal. Um, this part right here is massive. Like, I know this may not look too, I mean, it looks visually fun, but this is so helpful when you're like analyzing the different files because a lot of this is just undocumented. And when you have a visualizer like this, right, that's kind of taking the field data and like pumping it out and giving you mapping on the actual file, um, this is huge because you can use this to identify, you know, what needs to be worked on and find the patterns on the actual file and, you know, see where you have misalignments with both the input and output of a file. So, yeah. Um, technically, right now, Quail is, well, obviously it's not as feature complete as the um, EQGZI, namely because I have a bunch of bugs that need to be fixed. Like the EQG system has some bugs. Uh, it looks like it wants Arena. Let's go grab that real quick. I'm curious actually how it works in... Uh, I don't have... C drive games, uh, EQ, vanilla. We want arena.eqg. Apparently I was using that one. Isn't it EQG? What the heck? Arena. Oh, it's a back file. I apparently took it and made it a backup, so. Let's put it in here and take out the back extension. 
Okay, let's see if it'll load Arena with Windows with all my new tweaks on my test file. Do, 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 do. It's apparently compiling this for the first time run. I can hear my hard drive working there. So it just says OK, and that's fine, because the whole point of this is it outputs a PNG. Um, that's probably something I'm going to tweak. Like currently, I output the PNGs over here. But so this is the arena file. You can see here, arena.ekg. And this is all the different CRC outputs and files that are made from arena. Um, that's basically what that test does, right? It basically loads the EQG and analyzes all the data inside of it. There's another one that does a load, save, load. And the reason it does that is it loads the file, which in this case it says out.ekg. Let's change that actually to arena.ekg. And we're going to create instead a temp arena.ekg, right? So we're going to create temp EQG, then we're going to reload the temp version on the second try, like this, and we'll output two. Okay, so what this is doing, okay, I just kind of rewind what I'm doing here. I'm taking the original arena file, right? I'm loading it in Quail. Then I'm creating an output file and I'm writing the Qu arena file back out through the save process right here um, to temp arena, right? Uh, I'm also outputting a out uh, PNG, which I'll probably call this, you know, arena original dot PNG. Okay, so I did all that. Then I'm reloading the arena that I just generated, right? And then I'm saving the uh, output of that, and we're going to call this arena uh, new. Okay? So let me show you the run, and you'll get a better idea, assuming I didn't screw up any of these paths. Do, 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 do. I need to write a lot more tests, by the way. A lot of these are kind of specialized, but, you know, I'm just conceptually conceptualizing this out right now. I'm also curious why the debugging is so slow on my Windows machine, like doing this test. It's instant on my Mac. I'm not fully sure why this is taking a long time. Because this program's not very complicated, like with all the different parts of it. Oh, we got a crash. That's probably why it took so long. Um, looks like the inspect is working. But there's a header offset. I wasn't expecting this. It might be because of me trying to load my own file. We could actually start analyzing this. Because now you can see Arena Original, right? Here's all the data for Arena Original. And now we have a arena.eqg here. And I'm actually curious, will this open on eqzip? Because this file, yeah, so this file was made by Quail. And this file is the original. And as you can see here, it's analyzable by EQZip. Um, I'm not fully sure why I'm breaking it, though. It says it's timed out while it's running this. Interesting. What part? It was doing an image dump. I wonder if it, like... Uh, Honestly, why do you need to defer saving? Can I just output save and be done? Let's see if this makes it run faster. I don't think the defer should impact it though. I, I don't know why we're having a 30 second. Yeah, so that worked fine this time. I don't know why that, or I think it did. It said, okay, the second file is called out two. I was supposed to call that arena two actually. Arena. Um, did I not call it arena out? Oh wait, this is the wrong file. <laughs> okay, that's why I didn't, I'm on the wrong file. Hold up. I need to get back to 
EQGZ load test. This is what screwed up. That's why it like worked instantly and fine on the second try. Let's try this again. So amusingly, my two fixes to convert was deleting one character to fix default texturing and adding one character to fix light location. So I didn't even change the character count so far. Interesting. Uh, yeah, dude, I'm really out of sync with that project. I, I mean, I get an idea of what you're doing, but my hope is to replace all of EQGGI with this project because this project, in my opinion, is doing it quote unquote right. And that is I'm breaking on down all the different features and I'm getting bi-directional support on all of it. Because, you know, EQGCI is not, it's very rigid on what it supports and doesn't support. Um, yeah, so this is like looping, trying to make the image and it is struggling hardcore. I wonder if it's because dir entries, let's, let's break point and let's see if we can debug why this is happening. So if we hit debug, No, that is, and I'm curious about, you know, what's the latest. All right, so here it is. It's analyzing uh, the first file. It's supposed to break point here when it gets to, oh, this is why it takes so long. Okay, here we go. So the number of entries is 150 on this file, right? So this is the first run, right? So it's, going to do the 150 files. We can go and hit continue. So now it's outputting the 150 files. Yeah, that's the intent, Zergling. And my hope is I want to get animation both for S3D and for EQG to work in Quail. And I also want to be able to do... So the only area I probably won't bother with is saving and exporting S3D format, like the old legacy stuff, I only want to bother with loading. I want to take that data and load it into something that's compatible with modern editors or you know the modern stack. Okay, so that just iterated 150 files on the original. And now we're going to go ahead and um, save the file basically, right? So there's the file. Here's the second one. So now it's parsing all of the CRCs here. Man, that's very expensive with how I'm dumping every single entry. I sh could probably clean that up. Okay, so here we go. We have 150 files again. Okay, so we're doing fine. Now it's dumping out all the different entries. And... Once it gets to 150 down here, I'm curious if it crashes again. I don't. Maybe it's because loading this file takes so long that this test doesn't work so well. <laughs> that that actually might explain what's happening here. So it wasn't that this is truly failing. It's more, um, it it's longer than 30 seconds to fully extract this with all the analyzers and the dumps that I'm doing. Yeah, because now I just hit the success point again. Now if we hit continue, done. Detaching, files done, and now we have new versus original. Obviously, this is doing like an inspect, and that's what these pictures are. But what I'm really after is you'll see like my ending is misaligned and slightly different between the two, as you can see right here, which is a little worrying. I'm pretty sure I do a different date timestamp on the very end. Oh man, this picture's so big you can't see the bottom. <laughs> but uh, theoretically, a lot of this file is the same. Like I was able to replicate. Um, you can see like the dir offset is slightly different. The PFS is the same. The version's the same. The chunk data should be about the same. And I think my footer is off. I'm going to go ahead and remove... Uh, I'm debating if I want to remove the, uh, the each entry or not. But basically, you can see what's going on here. Uh, we can do an analysis, actually. We can go to the hex editor, take this file. Then we can go to the hex editor on this side for this file. 
And now we have both files side by side. And the part I'm interested in really is the bottom. So you'll notice one thing I've done, and this is just my latest version, they timestamp on the normal version with uh, like the same date every time. Where me, I'm actually creating the last date. Um, also, they don't have a Steve ending. And I do. I wonder if that's partly why um, I'm pretty sure EverQuest doesn't like my zone files. And that could be partly why. But that's something I need to debug on Quail. There's a lot of little bugs like that. But as you see, I am very close to recreating the original EQGs and making it so that, you know what I mean, it loads and uh, generates an EQG. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that was one of the projects I was working on was I had to clean up EQG. And there are a ton of little sub projects that need to be done. And each of these just need time. I need to spend the time to sit down. I was writing an object importer. Um, it works. It can load and import an object file, um, which means that we technically have a pap pipeline, pipeline now that you can take OBJ and MTL files and turn them into mod files. And that's pretty huge because um, that's really like the only major step you need in order to like inject placeable objects into, for example, existing zones. So once we get a little bit more of these you know, features complete, um, it's going to be a lot easier to take an existing zone, right? Extract it, or even just point it to the you know EQG, and then like modify data entries inside of the EQG file, and then regenerate it with the changes, right? So where EQGCI requires you to put it all the way back to the you know Blender step, and then you have to take it from Blender all the way back to export. With this, you can do, you know, data fiddling where you can be like, okay, I want to modify, uh, you know, a DDS file or I want to modify a mod file. Um, that's going to be a lot more doable now. Um, <laughs> regarding playable races, so that's, that's a whole can of worms. But the first step to playable races, yeah, my audio triggers aren't working on... Uh, st st Streamlabs, unfortunately. I should fix that. I have it working on OBS, but Streamlabs is a little outdated. Unless you guys can hear it and I'm missing it. But um, yeah, as far as playable races go, first step is making NPCs work. And we do have a pretty significant effort uh, milestone for that to work towards. Um, if we go back to EverQuest and we go find like a uh, NPC, which here's a bat, right? You'll notice we can take the bat. We're actually going to toss it in here. Bat EQG. We're going to go ahead and drop this into the bat file like so. We can see that a bat is a mod file, right? So theoretically, if we go take the um, EQGZ mod loader, or actually the mod load test file, and we target instead of gears, we'll go ahead and comment this actually, we target bat EQG and then bat mod, we can now test loading the mod file for bat. Uh, eh, we got an ID out of range on face 460 on the material ID. Can't really say what that's about. It could be a... Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> I just randomly tested that, obviously. Uh, let me see if I can fix that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a um, bypass for that real quick. Material by ID for face this. I'm going to just squelch this for now, and I just want to see if it will work. This is because I'm like 
analyzing. Okay, so material name is now not found on uh, add face. So again, I'm just going to squelch that. I, I do a lot of like sanity checks on things even a little bit more diligently than what's required. Yeah, exactly. Dash dash test. Uh, but let's see if it actually uh, output the file. I don't know what's going on now. It's like taking a long time. But that's also because we load, save, load. Oh, it did finish though. So this file, woof. okay. <laughs> this file I believe is the bat. And there is so much, yeah, you can see here all the bones and everything I recognize. So you have like the root bone, the pelvis, the chest, all the rigging, the neck, the head, brow interesting is it really that ear jaw lid head name head cam so there's a lot of bone rigging going on on just even a bat on modern eq models but you can see there this is kind of an example of you know loading a mod file and it relatively works apparently I can't tell if this is my fault that these two have to be commented out like this or if it's the file's fault. We can try another one real quick just for fun. I don't normally, I'm not like stress test loading stuff right now because obviously we're still prototyping. But yes, it was not a catastrophe. <laughs> Black sales is zone. What's a classic uh, race model? I'm trying to think of one that's like simple. Like orc, isn't that one? I can't even tell what these are. Yeah, this is like the modern orc. There we go. But this is going to be um, a little gross, but we can try real quick. So let's go ahead and just pop that in here. And yes, I do have an extractor. For some reason, it broke on... Windows conversion, but we can go ahead and copy this over real quick. It's not end of the world to use EQZip. And let's go to the tester again. And let's go ahead and run orc now. That should be all we need to load it. No. What's the mod file name? Oh, this is old school, MDS. This is another file format. I don't think I, I actually support. This is an EQGS. Do I have an MDS file? No. So that's another file format that needs to be supported. Um, I'm not fully sure what's the differences between MDS and MOD, but you see that M mod files are EQGM and MDS uses EQGS. And just at a glance, you can see that the bone rigging and stuff in there, there's a chance they're relatively compatible. But obviously, that's another like to do, you know, is to add um, MDS support. There you go. <laughs> uh, this is my like listing of different files and what's supported so far, or at least prototyped. And oh, let's take another one. I'm just having fun here. I want to see if I can find one that's a little simpler. Um, the problem is, is most NPCs, just by their nature, have a lot of animations and just junk in them. One thing we could do real quick for fun is we can go to the bat. So they have a lay file. By the way, it's always fun when they have this, like the FF create command is sitting in here. Uh, yeah, see all these anti files? These are the animations. Uh, we have an anti loader that I've been working on. And we can actually take this and test it. So bat, bat, uh, oh man, these are weird names. I'm just going to copy one. There you go. And then we can see what this looks like. I don't know what SLPR is, but we can now take the output 
And here is the animation data for the EQG A file, A being the animation. And you can see here, this is a analysis of all the bones and transforms and stuff going on with it. So uh, for EKG bare bone simplest, wouldn't Dragorn or Bazoo be a good one? I don't know, dude, it's subjective. Um, I like the gear that I've been working on in Steam Font Mountains because it's a very simple rigging. Um, but as you can see here, to animate a um, like a bat, and I think this is just the old school OG bat right here. Uh, we can actually verify that real quick. Or not OG, but like the revamp of the bat. I think this is, yeah, you can see the green eye. and Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is the the bat that gets replaced in all the modern zones, you know? Um, you can see the number of animations it uses. But I'm pretty sure my animation loader is now properly parsing this file. Um, and we now also parse the mod file. So we're on the good track, right? We're, we're getting closer to um, getting to the point that at least loading and parsing the data. And therefore, once I can get the data parsed, I can start working on getting the data to export. And that's key because then we have a struct that we can then map external tools, right? And then we can write loaders for like whatever formats we want and, you know, write some adherence standards. But you can see where this is like compartmentalizing each of the steps. So like if we wanted to make a custom NPC, right, we could potentially take a blend file, load it up, and convert it with certain standards and export it as a mod file with all the DDSs and any files. You see what I mean? And not be as stickler as we are with EQGZI on like standards and stuff. Um, that's kind of my hope, my end goal, my end game goal. Uh, and the same thing with zones, right? Where a zone is ultimately, I believe the tur file, isn't that the big one? I, I I'm a little rusty on this. Yeah, this is the terrain file struct. This is where the majority of your model data is. Um, so the terrain file structurally has a very similar style to uh, mod files. However, mod files can be animated and these are like placeable objects. These are, you know, baked assets. So like if you think about it like a windmill, right? When the windmill is churning, uh, to make a windmill turn, you need bone data and then you need animation data to make, make that spinning effect happen. You can't do that in terrain data. But terrain data is typically what the majority of the zone is made of. So you can see how that kind of works. Uh, I forget what the W world does. This is a, I think this is old school, yeah. World is the original terrain data. So this is an S3D format. Um, which by the way, I do have S3D in here. Uh, and as you know, S3D is the old school way. And I believe, yeah, so world actually has a bunch of fragment types. This is the old school way where like, you know, there were fragment definitions and each of these have, you know, specific data types inside of the fragments. And as you can see, I have a pretty high level of documentation on this, but, um, like here's the the mesh of animated vertices. The goal eventually is to take a world file and parse the meshes, animation vertices, and all the other data, including polygon animations or whatnot, the skeleton hierarchy and hi uh, references, and convert it into a, let's say, GLTF format or just a common generic format. Because once you do that, we can look at exporting it back to EQGZ or EQ. G, aka mod file with dot any, and we can modernize any classic model and have a middle step that you can edit it, right? That's like the golden path, right? And if we can do that as well for zones, the world is our oyster. <laughs> Personally, EQG, or EQG is a better standard like to work with, to manage and all that. So my goal is eventually to make everything modern. And besides in EQ, as you know, EQG supersedes S3D whenever it does loading. Um, so even if there's like, let's say plane of air, if we want to replace this, if I can parse the original plane of air, turn it into modifiable data, 
and convert it over to EQG cleanly, you can just put that EQG on top and not have to touch the original files at all, right? And then you have a way to like mod it and add islands or whatever you want, right? Um, that's kind of like pie in the sky end goal. Anything that gets me to uh, custom raises without touching open zone sounds amazing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and of course, um, yeah, if we want to talk about scary, let's go look at, okay, I, I'm trying to remember, where is the um, the global players? Yeah, they're right here, global elf and stuff. Here's froglock. This is the a uh, the S3D, where's the modern files? Are they also S3Ds? They may be. Yeah, this is the original frog locks. Um, yeah, you can see this is old school, WLD, S3D. But loading the modern EverQuest character models, that will be an exciting time when we finally start to rig that and get that like animated. Um, I'm pretty sure though, it has a lot of weird standards, so it's never going to cleanly export. Um, but hopefully we can make it sane. But once we can start modding that, we can fix things like that elbow problem that's been on EverQuest Dark Elf since the beginning when they wear plate armor or other types of artifact issues. Um, as well as we could potentially fix the, uh, Velius helmet bugs in both titanium and ROF2. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And we are on the right track. There's a lot of work left, but I have a lot of the framework done, right? To like start taking each piece and like analyzing it. And in your case, dead zergling, what I'd love to do is start helping or start teaching you a little bit more about like my loaders and my savers, like these little test files and getting your environment set up where you can sit here and kind of nitpick and do some QA um, cause even if you're not a coder, if you can find me patterns on like why, you know, the output file is not right or misaligned or, um, you know, some of the calculations that would be huge for me to save time. Right. Cause that's kind of like a testing front front. So, you know, of course, if you can code, you can potentially fix a lot of these, but if you have struggles, like keeping up with the code, even just being able to run the tests and do AVs would be huge to, um, you know, do checking and stuff or you know targeting different eqg files kind of like what you do when you export all the different um spell effects doing things like that for me would be massive um and as you know one thing i really want to now address is that the anti file is now theoretically getting loaded into the bone data here um but this data type doesn't align one to one to the GLTF uh, skin and animation data, so we're going to have to write a conversion map between the you know the triangle meshes and the standard that GLTF uses and the coordinate system um, and even the pivots and how it does like inverse bind match matrices and everything. This all has to be converted from a EverQuest style to, I think GLTF is the best winner. And once we get this conversion done, um, I believe we're going to miss some data, but I don't think that's the end of the world. And what I mean by that is like the size of a bone is data that typically gets stripped out because it's not required in order to replay animation data. However, that's super helpful when it comes to like modding this stuff. But like Blender can take a GLTF with skin rigging and, you know, animation data and work with that to um, like, it'll give you simulations that'll at least give you a visual to artistically kind of mod, you know, joint data. Um, yeah. So what I'm saying is there's likely going to be a loss of data on this conversion, but I think that's totally acceptable for anybody. Um and it also technically means that if we take somebody that's good with rigging and animations, they could rig up a file in any modeling program, export it to GLTF, and then we can take that GLTF and turn it into a mod and an any file. And you know what I mean? Go full circle. And all that data is going to be stripped on the export as well. You know what I mean? But that's because it's not supported fully in the any and the, uh, the mod file. 
Yeah. And yeah, the animation data, I got to figure out all the interpolation types, if that's even supported or not. There's a lot of work to do. Um, but we're on a good first step. And I believe EQG animation data is like uncharted territory. Um, most people have focused like all their previous effort in S3 world. So world fragments, all that, that's relatively well documented between open zone and all that, but nobody touches EQG, um, especially when it comes to animation data and stuff. So this is pretty exciting, you know, to be at a potential point where uh, not hopefully a whole bunch of work and we're going to start exporting workable GLTFs from, you know, like this bat um, making it into a GLTF format. Um, you can see here, I have a loader and the loader is technically working now. So now what I need to write is my exporter. Uh, it's probably in mod. I have one like this. I have import GLTF. This is one of my testing. What I need to write is my export GLTF, um, which is not here. And write that for any and write that for mod. Actually, yeah, I think I'll have to do it that way where I'll have a GLTF file and that GLTF will need to be mapped to convert into this style, you know, with the data relevant. Um, yeah. So anyways, fun stuff. One thing that's a little interesting is when we load a like bat file, right? What we're probably going to need to do in the quail parser is when you target a mod file to get all the animation data and output it to a GLTF, I'm going to probably have to iterate the path and look for .any files and load all these as new animations with their file name being the animation name. So like this is a swimming bat and this is a walking bat and bake all this into a single GLTF file, including the texture references. And I'm not fully sure what the PRT, PTS and all this is. Uh, this looks like points of um, like damage points and stuff. So this is going to be a whole other part that needs to be supported eventually. So lots of work. But that's basically like where spells effects come from and things like that. Yeah, and this looks like a little bit more of that. In fact, are those both EQPTs? No, this is a PTCL. But you can see like damage point, um, spell point chest where it casts. And then these probably match together because you can see now spell point default, root bone. This is more bone rigging stuff that needs to be mapped out. Um, but I imagine this is for, you know, where does a weapon equip? Where does a spell cast from? You know, where does armor equip at? I'm imagining that's part of this. Yeah, I can see here right hand spell left point for the right hand. Exactly what I'm expecting. I don't know what farm is. Maybe that's arm. Yeah, arm, <laughs> hand, spell point, leg data. That's important, I think, leg data, because you think about it, some spell effects go on the bottom of the mob. Um,. Anyways, so this is more data that needs to be parsed and exported. Are you familiar with the Vermandis bourbon of the Lantern expansion? He lets you export models and animations as GLTF. Uh, I don't believe I am mixed familiar with it. Is it open source? What do you call it? The Vermandis? The problem with Lantern is that... Um, wow, I totally type of that. Uh, it's 100% focusing on S3D. I know he talked about adding support for... Um, yeah, you can see here, WLD, PFS, and sound. This is 100% classic. And it does have skeleton tracking here now. Um, this would be an amazing thing. In fact, you know, another part I would love to do is take all these, you know, the bone data... This says it was three years ago. So I, I'm guessing this doesn't have the animation still. Yeah. It has skeleton data, but it doesn't have animation. But uh, 
then again, this is master. I think he has a developer branch. There we go. I don't keep up with this. Yeah, there's something like 14 months ago, two months ago even. Nice. So what are the fragment there? Do we have animation and other? Yes. So now we have animated vertices as of 15 months ago. This is super useful for me. I'm, again, like this kind of goes into this realm. S3D has a frag or world has a fragment section and I have all these mappings and we're going to eventually need to take some of this data. The granted, a lot of what he's done is already documented from open zone. Uh, not to belittle his work. I mean, it's amazing to look at C sharp over <laughs> Pascal any day. Uh, but you know, there are some um, things in here that I believe already have. So this is mesh animation. I don't know what the idea is on this. It says it's 37, but that's in, um, I have for this mapper, by the way, 37 is, M animated vertices is what I call this. Yeah, it's animated vertices. And yeah, right now this struct was empty. So this is likely new data that needs to be populated in here. Um, but you can see me, I was loading Crushbone and stuff. Okay, so Vermendez has a fork. Is this likely just a linked fork? Let's see. No, I don't want to fork it. I want to look at forks. No... Where is like the fork link? Three branches. I guess you can't f see forks until you fork. That's stupid. Anyways, Vermedes. I don't know how to spell his name. There. His version has a multi inject line uh, branch. And he lets you export models as GLTF. So you're saying in his version, he has a GLTF converter somewhere in here. And yeah, that could be extremely helpful. If we can get this mapper, I mean, obviously this stuff is not one-to-one, -one, but um, if we can leverage some of this tech into Quail, that would be amazing. Because, you know, ultimately the goal of Quail is not to specialize. Um, I don't like world files very much because it's a kind of archaic style and there are limitations galore on it. I prefer EQG, but I mean, ultimately there's nothing to stop writing a full generator of a WLD file as well, right? The biggest issue with that is that um, the breakdown of files inside of EQGZ or EQG is a lot easier, right? Because each file is individualized on its chunk. Where in S3D files, there's literally just a .wld and it has all of this data baked into it, right? So there's just a bunch of fragments. Um, there's a reason they replaced it, you know what I mean? <laughs> Not to mention uh, S3D only has one way to light data where um, EQG has like four different ways to do lighting. So you can make a lot more, you know, immersive and dynamic lit zones. Um, but yeah, so somewhere in here, there is a GLTF reference. Let's see if we can find it. In fact, let's, I don't think I can search on forks, unfortunately. No. He has PFS, he has this WLD helpers, exporters, GLTF writer. This is likely going to be close to what I want. He's baking some pre built data. But this is still super helpful, yeah. Yeah, you can see how limited the shader types are on the classic. But that is cool that he's, you know, mapping 
the EQ material shader types to a um, GLTF material types with like the alphas and stuff. I'm assuming he's unidirectional too, right? Does he allow you to import the GLTF back to S3D? I doubt it. Because I don't even think Lantern does that. It's an extractor only. <laughs> That's funny that you're admiring your lights. Um... Correct. This is mainly for the Lantern project or the, you know, they're, they're remaking a new client and this is like all the extractors to take the old data and turn it into a modern format, which is, you know, totally cool and admirable and not to belittle their project whatsoever. They've done an insane amount of work. Um, hugely appreciate it. I love this stuff, right? Like this is huge. I'm going to probably even note it. Um, probably my readme. Probably do it like this. But that's cool. He actually got the rigging for animation data. The old school animation system you can see here is hard baked on a lot of the, you know, pre-made styles. And I believe the new version has a little bit more data in this. Does he also export pivot points like the spell casting locations and stuff I'm guessing he skipped that most people don't go that intricate on some of their data at a glance it doesn't look like it is he even exp does he export a bone or does he just export the animations let's see skin He has is skinned. It's a boolean. And he's adding triangles to meshes. But yeah, add skin mesh. This may have into the scene. Here's your singular bone indexes. Those are your, yeah. Yeah, this is the crap we're gonna have to learn. It's those mapping headaches and stuff. It does export joints. Okay. Nice. No, this is cool. I think, um, yes. So this is a great like starting point and we can definitely reference this when we want to focus on taking classic models and especially modernizing them. This will be a massive jump. Uh, but again, we first need to get modern. I think we got to get modern models to work fully, you know, a full export import process. And once we get that done, we can look at at least getting the, um, an importer for, uh, this file type into GLTF. And once we get that link done, as long as we don't care about exporting back out, you know, uh, NPCs back to S3D world format, um, we don't need to worry about the part this doesn't do, you know, it's less work. Yeah, this is my goal right here to do this with basically the EQG format is to take this style. The difference though is unlike his, I'm not just looking to load it and like export it as GLTF. I also want to then take the GLTF and turn it into, you know what I mean, the proprietary form formats. So bidirectional is important to me. Uh, cause that's what we need in order to make a true editor. And that does add a lot of, yeah, exactly. Two way bi-directional that adds a lot of headache. Um, for Spire there's, you just need it to have the, you know, GLTF export step, but, um, 
I love actually working on both import and export at the same time because then you can do like sanity checks. You know, you can compare the output file to the input file and, you know, look for differences. So it's actually helpful to work on both at the same time to see if your exported file can get re-imported essentially identically to what it was before. Um, but yeah. So I do have... My GLTF program, I actually think the package I use got improved recently. I'm using QMuntle right now. And this repo, go to latest QMuntle. Why can't you just give me the URL? I hate sometimes how that GoDocs doesn't let you just do this. This, they just added a new feature where you don't have to set URI paths when you save GLTF anymore where before you had to do URI paths and URI paths are used, yes, see, auto and a embed resources without URI when encoding. This is actually a big step and they just did this recently. Uh, yeah, this was three months ago, which I haven't touched this project in five months. So, and this has 158 stars. That's not massively popular. Gen technically is more popular. That's another, uh, Golang project that actually has a 3D engine. They have a loader for GLTF as well right here. The problem is, is their loader embeds a lot of internal gen engine stuff. And I don't really want to be exclusive to their engine. So that's why I ended up going for QMuntle because it's a little bit more agnostic for import and export. But as you can see here, a lot of these processes are relatively simple using GLTF, right? Like here's defining a, this mesh. Oops, I didn't mean to take the picture. You create the document, you map out all the mesh data, you put in the indices and the positions and color. Then you rig the nodes, which by the way, the nodes is actually where a lot of the bone data gets structured with GLTF. GLTF room would make it so easy to tap into something like, yeah, dude, there are so many GLTF uh, viewers for Node or like for, you know, websites, NPM. It's a super easy, I think this is actually what yours is, sample viewer. Yep. GTLF is a very modern um, system that just destroys OBJ. OBJ is, you know, the past. Um, but that's why as my intermediary or my export, I do have OBJ like partially supported or I was kind of experimenting with it, but I, I'm going to focus on GLTF when possible. And you can even see me here. I'm trying to do, add the materials, open the GLTF. Does this even work? Let's see. Oh, I need e-commons in GLTF format to load this. I don't know if I have the mapper yet of converting well, the GLTF import loads a GLTF file. Arguably, I could take this mod file and write a test load save GLTF, right? And we can take the object gears. I doubt this is going to work. There's still a lot of steps to this, right? But we take this file and we create a new file called um, GLTF. And then we go ahead and GLTF output. And then we can take this part out and what we're going to go ahead and do is when we, after we load it and we save it, we're going to do save or, oh, we don't actually have an export GTLF command. So this isn't going to work anyways. I need to write the function derp, but this is going to be my next step is I have an importer. I'm going to see if I can write the exporter. Um, and if I can get that working, because I know one of the issues I had with the GLTF exporter was the um, the URI requirements. So 
I thought I actually had an export GLTF somewhere. There. Terrain file, I had an exporter for GLTF. You can see it here. So you can see me here. I'm rigging the terrain file, which is kind of similar to mod. I could likely take a lot of this and just almost copy paste it um, over into the other file. Because terrain and mod are extremely close. I really doubt it'll be this easy, but we can kind of get started on it a little bit. All right, so export GLTF needs to have the right package. Wow. Hooray for standards, right? Because that's a lot of not errors. And this is because Um, oh, we don't have to create the file, so we can just do, there. So let's run this test, and let's see how my exporter works. Hey, good night, Akka. So if we go to EQ, temp, now we have a GLTF file. Seriously doubt it'll load, but you know what? Let's give it a whirl. Yeah, dude, it's only 10 p.m. here. But you can see here, it looks legit. Here's all the data I exported. But I have no idea what this is gonna load in Blender. It's probably gonna be off. So we're gonna open up a GLTF file and we're gonna target, um, what is it, EQ, temp, what? Wasn't it in temp? EQ temp should have an object years GLTF. Why don't you see it? Source. Okay, wait. We are in. Source quail EQ temp. There is a object years. Oh, it's typoed. Ha ha ha. That would explain it. Let's go back to mod low test and fix the typo. GLTF. Then we can go back to here. GLTF. And now let's open this. Uh. Yeah, obviously there's an error. Uh, man, I gotta remember this. There is a scripting. Honestly, it says it's successfully imported, but there's no data on it. So obviously there's some issues. I don't see errors in here. So, oh well. Well, but theoretically, that means it technically worked, uh, but there's just no data on it yet. But it's weird that it didn't even create a node. You know what I mean? But at least I got an export that seems valid. Now it's just a matter of testing it a little bit more, you know? So we're going to go ahead and revert these two changes. And what else did I add? I tweaked my zone file. I'll go put this back to object gears for load save load. We added the new GLTF endpoint. We added export GLTF. This is a lot of theoretical code that needs to be cleaned up anyways. Uh, we tweaked what Arena does. That's fine. Blender Windows had some issues. I was going to write an inline Blender system, but yeah, it needs some fixing. Here I tried to target a new any file. I can go back to the old one. Not a big deal. And then my README added some more notes. What is README show actually like? Yeah, GLTF writer for Ravenfriends. 
and lantern. There. And then we're gonna go um, added mod export GLTF prototype. There. But as you can see, Quail as a general project got a lot of moving parts. Um, but you know, once we focus on specific individual parts like this mod exporter, um, this mod exporter is likely, by the way, going to start having uh, an animation loader inside of it, right? So while the mod struct doesn't require animation data for the export to the mod file, we're going to likely bake in a reference to animations, probably in a map string that references mod or er, any any like this. And what that does is um, it'll take then when you parse a mod file, it will load and inject all the animation files if found. So it'll take, you know, it'll say, oh, there's a, this is a, or, you know, oh, there's a mod file here. Okay. So I'm going to parse that mod file. And then when I'm done and I have all the rigging and the, you know, the bones and everything like that, I'm going to check the directory for any any files. And then I'm going to parse all of them and add them in as animation entries. Right. And then when I export to GLTF, I'll have full context with the mod file on all the animations implied. You get that? So the anti loader would inject this data and then I would have a map like this that then maps it for GLTF export prepping. So yeah. What if you don't mind is your objective with this code new here? So this is a EverQuest loader. Uh, taking EverQuest files and converting them to and from more popular like engines and stuff, editors and such. So this will allow you to edit custom NPCs, custom zones. That's what basically this project's about. It's called Quail. Quail for EverQuest Universal Archive Import and Loader Tool. <laughs> it's an uh, interesting uh, sure hand. But anyways, I just added some code contributions. There's quite a bit left to do, obviously. Um, but yeah, Zergling, we'll sync up later. I just wanted to do this meeting kind of as a an overview, kind of show you where I'm at. I got a bunch of effort to work on though. And uh, kind of exciting though, especially I would love to be able to add like custom NPCs that are fully rigged and animated and put them into the game because that fixes so many things, um, especially if we can take like S3D and then turn it into... EKG. Uh, I'm starting off. <laughs> Which EQ are you starting off with? So this would work honestly with live. Um, it doesn't really matter which EQ. This is kind of agnostic to, you know, which EQ. And then yeah, Project EQ is releasing their debut. Dude, Project EQ database has been released since like day one. Uh, where is the PEQ? Uh, yeah, right here. So if you go to the DB project EQ.net, here's all the data, like all the snapshots. And there's also a latest link. So if you want the latest database, you just go right here, click. So yeah, they've done this for years. <laughs> What is whole tomato? I, I'm not familiar with that, dude. Just curious. Would it didn't we have issues opening EKG past dawn expansion before? Uh I think so. And I think I fixed it. Like, honestly, I think that was pretty easy to fix when I did Quail. Um there is some you know, obviously problems with Quail Steel when it comes to opening various things. But um those are more just code problems and not Quail itself or the zone files. But let's go to like uh, vanilla real quick and let's grab like a newer zone, like uh, uh, Plane of Shadow. That's super new. 
that's the latest of ROF2, right? And let's take Quail, go back to, uh, what is it? EQ, bump, we'll make a new folder, plain of shadow.eqg, bump. And let's just take all this and extract it over. And as far as what you're asking, what you're really asking is, can I load it? In fact, I should work on that real quick. So if we go back to here and hit go build, honestly, I think it's PowerShell's fault. Let's use command prompt, right? So extract temp plane of shadow uh, EKG. Right, here we go, extract flags. Okay. It's going to be EQ. Why does auto tab not working? EQ plain of shadow dot EQG. Um, let's do this. We're going to put this in here. And let's do this. Quail extract path is plain of shadow EKG. There. So like if we delete this file. Interesting it's not able to create the path. I could fix that actually real quick. Uh, really? So when we run extract, it's supposed to create file right here, right? But it's telling me cannot find this error is wrong. So this should be uh, I think it's like is not exist error. There we go. That should fix that. I'll look at your guys' stuff here one sec, sorry. Now I'm on a mission. Gonna move this back over. Yeah, replace it, that's fine. All right, so run that command again. There, that's what I wanted. So now it extracts, and you'll notice it extracts perfectly fine. And now that we've extracted, uh, when it comes to like the tur file, uh, I, I mean, my terrain loader is not fully done, but we can test it real quick. So right now I have a terrain loader for Steam font which apparently is not finding. But regardless, let's let's load the um, plane of shadow one. So we're gonna go underscore plane of shadow dot EQG, plane of shadow dot tur potentially. Let's see if it loads. Cannot find the file plane of shadow. Why would you not find the file located? Let's see, open. So from load test, it goes up one directory, it goes to EQ, then underscore PO shadow.eqg. That looks good. Maybe there's no uh, dot tur in here on plane of shadow. Let's see. Yeah, it's called shadow, I think. No, let's find the tur file. Where is the terrain file? Can I view this please as details? Weird, it has a stupid naming convention. That's the problem. Okay, so now we're loading terrain file. 
Uh, it does have the version failure that you're familiar with. Because <laughs> again, this is just copying it. However, um, if I comment this out, I think it'll still attempt to load. I'll probably get an error somewhere. We'll find out. It's trying. But you can see here, dead zergling, the issues with the past DON expansion problem. Uh, we now have a way to like isolate and hyper focus on the problem area, which is the terrain loading, right? So this is the the output that needs to be mashed. In fact, here you can see it's outputting all the data. And there is a ID out of range error again. And this is because my offsets are off, but it's attempting to load all that. You see what I mean? So, but now we have a way to like analyze it, especially like with the loader and start to actually fix this and get version three support actually working. So, yeah. I'm not gonna version that. That's not a big deal. It's interesting it did that when I went there. And I'm gonna fix this. Okay. It's a C++ Microsoft. Their product is called Visual Assistant. Great for coding. Well, this is Golang. I'm assuming whole tomatoes made for C++. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm assuming it's an IDE is what you're talking about. Yeah, it's a Visual Studio tool. I'm not using Visual Studio. I'm using VS Code. <laughs> is this what you're talking about? The Visual Assist? Yeah. This is for C Sharp, C++. It's not even, you have to buy it. There's a trial. That's gross. Yeah. So I'm, this is Golang. <laughs> so it's not even C Sharp or C++. Um, and this looks like an extension for Visual Studio. Got it. Yeah, why not just press Control T? What's different with theirs? Yeah, this looks like it's for Visual Studio. So. Yeah, like if I open this project, I get what they're doing with like the context fast search and stuff, but like just this one highlight that it's bringing up right here. Um, if you want to fast find things, just press control T and then you'd be like map filter. This thing is amazing. You can see properties, you can see functions. I'm assuming that's what they're trying to do with this context search. I mean, find references. That's easy. You can do the find all references, which is just control K after you highlight. I'm guessing they do some enhancements to that, but yeah. Anyways, this is totally not related to what I'm working on right now because this is going. <laughs> um, I, you mean you could bring up like Goland, which is an you know alternative IDE for Golang, but. Visual Studio Code is amazing with Golang, in my opinion. I love working it in on this. Especially because you got, like, you know, here's version tracking. It's really straightforward. Um, you know what I mean? There's a lot of cool extensions. I love doing multi-select, which is something Visual Studio still lacks on. Hell no. Why would I use Visual Studio? <laughs> it doesn't even support Golang. But, like, uh, I mean, I obviously use it when I'm, like, writing in C++. But like something as simple as multi-select, like let's say I have all these hex strings, right? And I'm adding an argument. I hold alt and I press enter and I do multi-select and I can actually come in here and be like rar and put in a new argument on all these. You see what I mean? Do that in Visual Studio. You can't. It's an archaic IDE that has a lot of limitations. It's debugger's amazing and it has a lot of cool features that it's done over the years, but yeah. It says Visual Studio code. 
to educate you real quick. Visual Studio Code, right, is a code editor that is a totally different product to Visual Studio, which is an old school, original Microsoft product, right? These are two different products, code.visualstudio and visualstudio.microsoft. So, because Visual Studio is actually open source, you can go see the go uh, the source code of it all, and it also is cross cross platform, which is another thing Visual Studio sucks at is that it's only they have a Mac variant, but yeah. Um, I guess what you might be asking is is that whole is Visual Assistant part of VS Code? Because I don't see it in the extensions list. What is it called? It wasn't it like virtual, yeah, visual assistant. Yeah, I don't see it as a top list at all. There's just other crap populated in here. From what I can tell, Ho Tomato is a standalone product. And they only work with Visual Studio, not Visual Studio Code. Plus it's paid, dude. How much is it? Yeah, it's $279. You know how much this costs me with the entire suite and all the extensions and everything? It's not semantics. They're totally different products. <laughs> like this doesn't support uh, Visual Studio Code at all. But um, anyways, yeah, they need to rename this from VS Code because it is too ambiguous, as you said. Um, but yeah, Visual Studio Code is most popular with JavaScript and web dev, but it does have a ton of languages it supports where Visual Studio is pretty much .NET and C++. It has some other languages it supports, but it's not, it's very isolated and it's very Windows centric because the Mac edition is honestly pretty horrible and it only does .NET and Mac. You can't do Windows or uh, C++. Um, I wasn't very impressed with the Mac one. I've messed with it, but anywho, I'm about to stop the stream. So hope you learned something. Those that are uh, hanging out and, uh, yeah, this project's got a lot of work ahead of it, but should be exciting and fun to get progress with. So if you watched, thanks for watching. 